This is Share the Vision, presented by the Resource Center, a discussion of the programs and services of the Resource Center and about issues related to individuals with disabilities. Those listening keenly will know that we're not in the studio as we begin today's program. Joining me on Share the Vision is Steve Watterson, Community Relations Director at the Resource Center. Steve Watterson, tell the audience where we are. We are at our day program that's located on Hazeltine Avenue in Jamestown. And why have we come here today for Share the Vision? We are here because uh, at the moment we are holding one of our monthly membership advocacy meetings. We'll call them open houses, but uh, they're really for family members of people with disabilities, members of the Resource Center, our own staff, and interested people from the community to come and learn about any issues that are currently uh, impacting individuals with disabilities and their families. We like to move these meetings around. We we alternate them between Jamestown and Dunkirk, so this was a Jamestown month, and this was the first time we've had one over at the Hazeltine building, and I I think it's been a while since you and I have been here so uh, to do one of our programs, so we thought we would uh, tape this week's program here and have an opportunity to talk to some of the Resource Center staff who can uh, address some of the issues that are uh, taking place right now and uh, maybe some family members as well. You can hear people coming in uh, down the hallway and into a kitchen area where most of the people are right now. Before we move in there, though, Steve, just to identify where we are, this is the small plaza that's opposite Purcell School in Jamestown, which is the Hazeltine facility of the Resource Center. And what, in a sentence or two, and I know we'll learn this in greater detail later, but Uh, of the many campuses or places that the Resource Center has in the community and throughout Chautauqua County, what happens here at this day program spot? This is a program for about 30 individuals with severe intellectual and developmental disabilities, and in this program they uh, learn skills of, uh, of daily living. This program is similar to the program location we have on Fluvanna Avenue, which is about the same size, and both of those locations, both Hazeltine and Fluvanna, were kind of offshoots of our larger program that's on Jones and Gifford Avenue at the Michael J. Raymond Center. With that introduction, let's turn around, walk into the area where all the other people are, and meet some of those who organize this event. Steve, I'm going to put my papers down and maybe have you do an introduction for me. I'm sure Virginia Bath would love to talk to you to start off, Dennis. Hello, Virginia. Hello. Steve told me that you are one of uh, several people who organize these monthly events for the Resource Center. What what is your uh, title? What is your work at the Resource Center? I am actually the Assistant Executive Director for QAQI in Compliance, and I have just joined Debbie Brown in regards to the advocacy. And one of the things that we want to do with this whole program is to really get more of our staff involved, parents involved, so that it is truly an advocacy program to protect the rights of all of the individuals that we provide services to, but also to advocate for additional services despite the funding extremes that we have. Okay, a lot of things to get into there, Virginia, so let me take this apart with you for a moment. First, QAQI, for those who are not familiar with the acronym. Quality assurance, quality improvement, so we look at all of the things in terms of some of the negative things in terms of surveys, but the quality improvement aspect of it is to make sure that we have programs, strategies, plans to make sure that we continue to grow and support everybody to become more independent and that we have quality services around the board. Now you mentioned the need, the desire to incorporate more families as well as more staff into an understanding of what happens in in a place like Hazeltine here? What is it that you hope to accomplish by getting those who are served, the families of those who are served, and those who serve them together? I think, you know, it really is. It's a joint operation. It's not just a a business. And I think one of the things is is that the Resource Center provides lots of different services, but to make sure that we're meeting the needs, not only of the individuals we're providing services for, they need to help us to advocate, whether it's for funding to support some of those services or when the funding is cut, then understanding that we as an agency may no longer be able to provide something. And so if they can advocate for themselves, and we can support them to advocate for themselves to make sure that we are continuing to provide whatever they need as a community. It's not just a resource center thing. It's the state of New York providing for a vulnerable population. Advocacy is something that you hear mentioned quite frequently in the context of the resource center 
these days, not only because it is necessary to have your voice heard, Mm -hmm. but it's good for people with disabilities to learn to advocate for themselves if they can? Mm -hmm. It's understanding what your rights are and demanding those rights. I think that we all have basic rights, and when some of those things have been taken away just because you have a disability, then we want to be able to teach people to stand up and to take on their own rights and to be responsible for advocating for those rights so that they continue to, to be supported, to be independent. That might be something that would be very difficult to do for some of the consumers here at Hazeltine, though. Steve Watterson leads me and the listeners to understand that they face a great deal of challenges uh, in their lives, some rather severe disabilities. I think many of the folks here at Hazeltine are very medically compromised, and I think the fact that most of them have such great health care and have survived so long really are because of, like, all the services that are available to them. But if the funding is cut, then that becomes something that you're no longer able to provide some of those services. I also think one of the things is that, you know, like the staff here, the nurses here, service coordination, support the individual so that they are treated just like anybody else when they go to the emergency room in the hospital. Because a lot of times it's like they're marginalized just because of their disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes at the hospital it's like not consideration that they have just as much right and and opportunities to be able to have good health and not to give up on them, you know, because I think most of the folks who are in this program, once you get to know them as an individual and not put them as a group, it's very difficult to marginalize them. You mentioned already in, in the course of our conversation two things that might seem very difficult to fuse together, and one is a vulnerable population, as you describe some of the people who receive services here, and at the same time an environment of constraint or changes in funding. And it, it must be very difficult to, to contemplate what could happen to people who need so much support if that support isn't there. I, you know, and I think that's true because the thing is I think one of the things that – I think this program makes it look very, very easy, but the amount of training that goes into ensuring staff are able to uh, support the individuals here, whether it's being able to move somebody who has fragile bones, somebody who is not able to take care of some of the basic needs, such as wipe their nose, cover their mouth, um, you know, go to the bathroom independently. It takes, you know, like yeah, two people, four people to, like, lift them and move them from one place to the other. And I think the key is to make sure that we're providing staff with the opportunity to have, like, an education, to have the skills to be able to work with somebody that is very medically fragile um, and very vulnerable and requires a great deal of hands-on to participate just in daily life activities. Virginia, I just have one other question for you, and the time's getting away from us. There are others to see uh, as we visit Hazeltine, but you are articulate and persuasive. What is your background? How did you become uh, interested in, and so passionate about this work? Well, let's see. I've worked in this field probably for Oh, let's say 30 plus years. You know, I've been at the Resource Center for about 11 years. Prior to that, I worked with a program that was across multiple states, worked with vulnerable agencies, vulnerable people. Background I have a master's in psychology and ABD, which is all but dissertation, and uh, uh, PhD for psychology. Wow. Thank you very much uh, for all of this. Uh, Uh, information and insight. I appreciate it a great deal. Thanks, Dennis. Appreciate it. You heard there from Virginia Vath, an assistant executive director at the Resource Center. Steve, I'll have you introduce me to the next person who's going to uh, go on the air. Sure. You'll next be hearing from Jill Souter. She is the supervisor here at the Hazeltine Day Program. Jill, thank you for, one, opening your doors here, and two, taking a moment to speak to me about what happens here. Sure. No problem. What does happen here? Well, every day we have 36 individuals. They live either in TRC residential or at home with their families. They come here and they enjoy a whole bunch of activities throughout the day. We do sewing projects. We do volunteering. 
We do painting, all sorts of stuff. Steve Watterson and Virginia Vath, prior to your appearance on this program, have talked to us about the fact that some of the people, many of the people that you have here, consumers who come here, face significant challenges in their lives. Yes, they do. They face a lot of medical issues, and they also have a lot of cognitive issues. Staff provide them with a lot of support. How many staff members do you have for the 36 people who come here? I have 18 staff. And what is the day? It is a day program, so I presume it runs... We are here from 8.30 to 4. And we get individuals come right at 8.30 and leave right at 4. And do the people who come here come only for a time, or do they come for a year or period of years, or does that vary? It varies. We have some individuals that come for half days, We have some individuals that come for full days, kind of depending on what their needs are. So, yeah. (laughs) I'm interested in learning more about the people who come here as consumers and those who come here to help them because it sounds as though it could be very challenging to build and provide activities for individuals with this level of disability and to work with them on a day-to-day basis must require a certain kind of temperament, a certain sort of person. Mm -hmm. I am very lucky. I have a great group of staff. They're trained in all of the special needs that we have here, medically and all the adaptive equipment. And I have very creative staff. For example, we have Train Like an Astronaut. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. And I have a staff who has taken all those activities. They work with OT, they work with PT, and they've adapted those activities for the individuals that come here specifically. At first blush, it might sound like impossible for persons with severe disabilities to be involved in something called train like an astronaut, to volunteer in the community, as you said, and yet you are working these miracles every day. Yes, we do. Everybody can learn. (laughs) What is your background? What Uh, sparked your interest in doing this kind of work? Well, I just kind of fell into it, quite honestly, but I have been here. I'm in my 18th year. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. I started as a tech in the room and then moved up to a treatment coordinator, and now I'm the site supervisor. What is the personal fulfillment for you in doing this work? Just seeing the, the smiles on everybody's face, seeing when they make that achievement, It's just very fulfilling. Seeing my staff grow and learn as well is very fulfilling to me. Thank you very much for taking these moments with me. Sure. Share the vision for the Resource Center coming to you today from the Hazeltine Day program. You just heard from the supervisor there, Jill Souter. Debbie Brown, whom we know well on Share the Vision, has been listening to this uh, interview. She did a great job, I think. She did. She Mm -hmm. did an excellent job. What is your title now? Because I remember last show we did, it was rather lengthy, and I didn't get it exactly right. Yeah, Director of Service Coordination and Planning, Family and Community Engagement. And you have a great deal of background and experience in day services. Yes, I worked in day services for about 34 years. Wow. So anything that you would like to add, having listened to all what's been said so far about this place, this work, the unique situation that it creates for the people who come here? No, I think Jill did a very good job summarizing it all. Like she said, the staff here are excellent. They really care about the people. And they come up with some very creative uh, ways to involve people in the community as well as in activities here at the site. One thing that Virginia Vath made clear to me as we were speaking earlier is that maintaining these programs, sustaining these programs in in the financing environment or or the, the money environment of today is very difficult. Yes, one of the first things that the Office for Persons with Developmental Disabilities is promoting is for people to try employment first. And that could be a very difficult challenge for some people with a lot of disabilities, you know, a lot of physical impairment that need the help that some of the people that we serve here um, have experienced. So this is in some ways uh, an opportunity for them to still get that community involvement through taking part in some small volunteer project that can help benefit people in the community. Thank you for your insight, uh, Debbie. Always great to see you. Good to see you, Dennis. You heard there from Debbie Brown, Director of Service Coordination and Planning, Family and Community Engagement at the Resource Center.
One of the issues that we wanted to make sure that we covered here as we visit Hazeltine today on Share the Vision, and we've talked a lot about the unique people who work here and the contribution that they make, we wanted to talk about employment at the Resource Center, and I understand you're the right person to do that for us. That would be me, yes. Give me your name and your title so we get it right on the air here. Lisa Melquist. I'm the recruitment coordinator for the Resource Center. What does that mean, Lisa? That I handle all recruitment activities um, going through the agency. So we are currently looking for direct care positions right here at places like Hazeltine. There's a wide variety of opportunities available if anyone's looking for employment. We have been talking through the show here about the uh, unique people who come here and the very special individuals who work with them. What are the qualifications? What kind of of, uh, people can be successful in an environment like this from your experience, Lisa? If you have something to give and you're a caring individual, you're the type of person we're looking for. You really don't need to have any experience. Uh, We do provide training. Uh, You have to have a driver's license, pass a drug screening, and then those are pretty much our minimum qualifications for direct care. And there's an opportunity to grow as an individual, to grow as an employee when you come to work for the Resource Center? Absolutely. We have wonderful career ladders and a lot of success stories within the organization. People start out in direct care and move right on up the career ladder. We have directors that began here in direct care, nurse practitioners. So uh, it's not a job for everyone, but it is a job that you can really grow and expand and learn in. What's your career history here? I began with the agency in a temporary status through a temporary agency as a secretary. And with the the guidance and support of the the Resource Center and my supervisors, I've gone back to school several times and I've grown and expanded within my career path. And um, I'm now the recruitment coordinator. So I'm one of the success stories as well. How can people connect with you connect with the Resource Center to learn more about opportunities. I'm sure that the application process that you mentioned is structured, so how can people uh, begin that? Well, you can visit our website at uh, trcny.org. You can also call 716-664-4JOB. And the personal satisfaction, uh, paychecks aside, the personal satisfaction that uh, you hear about from the people that you hire, there's something in this work that's very gratifying aside from earning a living. Yes, there's a lot of intrinsic value. You go home at the end of the day and you feel like you've really done something. You've made a difference in someone's life. You've made a difference in their day. You're helping them grow in their dreams and their goals and it just, it feels good on the inside. Thank you very much and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Okay, thank you. Lisa Melquist speaking there. She's the recruitment coordinator for the Resource Center. Steve Watterson asked me to introduce myself to uh, this next person whose voice you'll hear in a moment because she is a parent of a consumer at the Resource Center. Hello. Hello. What is your name? My name is Barbara Stewart. Barbara, thank you for coming for a moment to our microphone here. And who is this who's right behind you? That's my son, Jeffrey. (laughs) Now, Jeffrey, as I understand, is not a consumer here at Hazeltine, but is in a not the similar program elsewhere in the Resource Center. Correct. He uh, attends uh, Fluvanna Avenue, Dayhab. So it's very much like this on the other side of town. Correct. So uh, tell me a little bit about his experience and, and your experience with all of this that we've been talking about on the air here today in terms of what happens here and the staff and all of that. Well, he goes to Fluvanna Monday through Friday. Early in the morning, my understanding is, about 8 o'clock, and he spends most of his days there. He does have a community dayhab program where he goes out into the community two afternoons a week. I have been very happy with the staff at Fluvanna. They keep him busy because he's normally very active. Right now, he's just sitting because he likes that nice comfy chair. (laughs) It does look like he's enjoying it a great deal. Yes. (laughs) How long has your son been a part of the uh, Resource Center Day Program? The Day Program, just, oh my goodness, five years, I believe. And this has proven beneficial to him? It has, yes. But Jeffrey's been involved with the Resource Center for virtually all his life, right? Um, Yes, since he was two years old. And this year he will turn 32, so... We've long been time. around for a long time. Just describe for me the challenges that he faces since the public cannot come in and, and meet him here. Tell us a little bit about your son. 
Well, Jeffrey had his diagnosis is PDD-NOS, which is Pervasive Developmental Disorder, not otherwise specified. He is in the autism spectrum. He does not speak. He does sign, and he's very active. His attention span is short, so we have to keep him busy or interested in things all of the time. He seeks attention, so... um, we need to be paying attention to what he's doing most all the time. One of the things that has come out during the course of the interviews that we've done so far in this program is the challenges that the Resource Center faces in continuing programs like this. There are, in today's environment, from what Virginia Vath and others have said, uh, funding challenges, uh, um, changing environment in terms of how programs are put together and paid for, which leads me to this question. Where would you, your family, your son be if there were not a place like the Fluvanna Day program or the Hazeltine Day program? Well, it would be very detrimental to him. He needs to be kept busy all the time, and they are, you know, they, they keep him busy. They do crafts with him. He started doing some painting which we didn't really know he was interested in until the, an art teacher was here, Kristen. He loves painting. He's made a lot of different paintings. And, and I don't know as we would have found that at home. He also can do things because mom and dad a lot of times do things for him because sometimes it's easier. And he can do things now that we were not allowing him to do. So it's been very beneficial to him. Two other things that I will leave you. One, just speak to me about the quality of care, the concern that has been expressed toward your son by staff members here at the Resource Center, not individuals, but just overall. Overall, most of the staff is very caring. You become family when you live in one of the homes, and even when they're with you every day, they're part of your family. The staff is part of Jeffrey's family. He looks forward to seeing them. And he asks about them um, in his own way. <laughs> and he's a resident of a TRC facility also? Correct. He lives on Party Avenue in a group home with seven, six other guys. <laughs> and, and Barb is also the vice president of the board. So I don't know if there's anything that you want to speak about in terms of the challenges that the agency is facing from your seat on the board of directors, anything that you see. Well, it... it <sighs> That's, I don't know if we have enough time to do that right now. <laughs> it, it is challenging. We are always looking for, you know, we want the best staff. We, we've had some challenges this last year with um, finances, and it's looking a little better now. We have Denise is our new executive director, and we're very happy that she has taken over that role. And as a board, we are very concerned about what's going on in the organization. And um, we're just trying to get advocacy so that we can hopefully get to the governor and get the finances that are necessary for the resource center. State support, then, is essential to what is done here. The programs that are so important to your son could not occur, could not continue without the support of the taxpayers of the state of New York. Correct, correct. This has been a deeply insightful interview, and I'm so grateful for you taking the time to say all of this about your life, your son, your commitment to this place. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I, I, I don't know. My life has changed so completely since, well, it's been 30 years now, but the Resource Center is such a big part of our lives that I... I spend a lot of time here <laughs> in various committee meetings, and, and happily so. So I am thankful that the Resource Center is here in Jamestown. It makes things so much easier for us to have him local, and then we can still spend time with him. We can see him whenever we want. Thank you for giving back. Okay. Thank you. The voice there of Barbara Stewart, Resource Center Board Vice President and a parent of a consumer at the Resource Center. Dr. Todd Jacobson has been a frequent guest over the years on Share the Vision. His commitment to the Resource Center is well known. You've been president of the board and involved in many ways over the years. Thanks for coming to the open house. Sure, Dennis. Thanks. 
Nice to have you here. What and is your <clears throat> impression, your observations about a place like Hazeltine Day? I know this is just an amazing place. You don't realize that we're driving by on uh, on the street here, but th- there's so much that we keep the folks active and and busy all day. These are the more severe folks from the ICF that are here. Are there any? Uh, from, and you would be the right person mm-hmm. to tell me. Are there any other consumers at the resource center who face any greater challenges than those who come to a day program no, like these? These would be the most severe that you've seen, and uh, the folks working here are just phenomenal. They're very interactive with them, and they're keeping them busy and active all day long here. So uh, it's a great facility. It's well laid out. They have all the equipment necessary, and uh, the staffing is, is, like I say, just superb here. And uh, it certainly keeps the resource center functioning during the weekdays to keep these folks active and and physically fit. They do PT and OT here. But as treasurer of the resource center, (laughs) our concern right now is with uh, Governor Cuomo's uh, plans to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which we fully support. These folks need to be paid a lot. However, the state is not funding the resource center and other voluntary nonprofit agencies to supply that extra boost in the minimum wage. So five years down the pike, when we reached $15 an hour, that certainly involves you know, close to probably a third of the staff the resource center would have to be boosted up in wages, yet they're not giving us any more from Medicaid, which is our primary source. And once you increase the minimum wage up, then you have wage compression of those above 15. So it's going to be a lot in the next 5 to 10 years to financially try to reconfigure things so we can accommodate this. But uh, we're really approaching uh, the state legislators and the governor to try to increase our funding through Medicaid to provide the, those wages. Well, and we learned earlier that for the 36 people who come to this day program, there are 18 employees who work here. And considering the level of disability, as you have said, right. that the staff members are helping people with here, it would be impossible to cut staff. I mean, you couldn't do it with fewer people. We have, we have very few areas that we can actually cut staff. And our, our more pressing concern with that is if you're raising the folks at McDonald's to $15 an hour, the folks working with these severely handicapped people who it takes a real energetic person and a lot, a lot of uh, compassion but a lot of responsibility as well. And for being paid the same as flipping burgers, uh, we're going to have trouble attracting new new employees here, I think, if we don't get this changed well there's some working room there's some time to advocate uh, and and to maybe get this evened out and it's not happening immediately absolutely no it's it's being phased in at least in the upstate areas over a number of years but we need to really get the word out to the governor and the legislators that they they need to address the funding of the nonprofits to accommodate that, and then we'll be fine with it because I, I, we really think that our folks deserve a living fifteen dollar an hour wage. But unless they fund it for us, it's going to be very difficult to to manage the resource center. Dr. Jacobson, it's always wonderful to speak to you. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Thanks, Danny. Dr. Todd Jacobson, treasurer of the resource center. Steve Watterson joins me as we draw today's edition of Share the Vision to a close. I hope, Steve, I've I've tried very hard during this uh, very brief time that we've had here at Hazeltine to encapsulate the nature of the place, the nature of the people who work here, uh, some of the uh, challenges that are faced not only by the individuals but by the Resource Center as an institution attempting to serve them. It's really quite a story. I hope 
we've told it over the last half hour here. Oh, no, I think we did a great job. And, and just a reminder for uh, listeners who may have come in late, we're recording this at one of our monthly uh, open houses that we have uh, that are geared for our own staff and for people with disabilities and their families and anyone else who's interested in knowing more about what goes on at the Resource Center, but also some of the uh, issues and challenges that are, are facing uh, not only uh, people with disabilities and their families at the Resource Center, but uh, across the state and the country. So we have these on um, the second Monday of every month. They alternate between Jamestown and Dunkirk. So next month's meeting in March will be at uh, our uh, facility on Lakeshore Drive in Dunkirk, and then we'll be back here in Jamestown in April. And if anybody would like to come, the meetings are free. We have refreshments, as you saw, so everyone's welcome to come. They run from 4.30 to 6.00. Uh, one other thing, just quickly before we close. I see we're in February now, March, April, May, June, July, five months to Laurel Run. Having our first organizational, well, we're taping this on a Monday, so we're having our first organizational meetings tomorrow and Wednesday. So we're beginning to gear up. It's our 20th annual, so it's a big one, and Mr. and Mrs. Hotelling want to make this one special. So we'll see what we have to announce in the coming months. Steve, to you and everybody here at the Hazeltine Day Program, thank you for sharing the vision today. Thanks, Dennis.